How much does it cost to buy happiness? What's the relationship of money, wealth, and how happy you are about life? It's Brian Preston, the money guy. Yeah, Brian, I'm, I'm actually really, really excited. Well, I'm excited, excited about every show that we do, but I'm really excited about this one because uh, we have a unique perspective in the fact that in our day job, we're fee-only financial advisors. So the thing that we get to talk with people about most often is their money and their finances and what they hope it accomplishes and the doors it h helps them open. Uh, and a lot of times, whether it's clients or even just potential clients, I think some people maybe have an uh, inaccurate view of what money and wealth can truly do for them. No, no doubt. And I feel like, just so y'all know, I feel like I'm part of the B-52s. Shiny, happy people. I have watched TED Talks. I've watched numerous you know, YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. I've read books. I feel like the relationship between money and happiness, I'm your dude. You're the guru. Well, guru might be a strong word, but I've definitely... Let's just say crammed for the test. All right, got it. Perfect. So, and, and, and the thing is, when I hear about money and happiness, I want to make sure we understand there's 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 two levels we're talking about here. Because okay. if I t approached Bo on the street and I said, talk to me about what you think money and happiness is, mm -hmm. you're thinking TMZ, MTV Cribs, Lifestyles of the yeah, Rich and yeah, Famous, yeah. people throwing out money all that's over me. the place, right? Yep, that's it. That is different than when you do any type of research on how much money and happiness, and it doesn't matter. What's funny is how many places I see the same number, this $75,000. Malcolm Gladwell talks about it. Yep. Jonathan Clements talks about mm -hmm. it. Um, God, I mean, I got to tell you, about every article I read mentions $75,000. Okay. And when I hear that number, I'm like, is, is that that's not MTV Cribs, that's not Robin Leach and Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, right? I mean, so so I want to make sure we under that we talk about the two distinctions that we have here. So what what you're saying is is that there's a difference between happiness and fulfillment, and yeah. there's a difference in what that seventy five thousand dollar number we're going to talk about. There's a difference in what that does versus something else that's sitting out there. Happiness in terms of when you see financial pieces written about happiness and they put a dollar to it is on can you cover necessities. Okay. Fulfillment is how excited are you to attack each day? Do you feel like your life's moving in the right direction? You're doing what you were putting That is, in. yeah, that's that's kind of my word, the fulfillment side, because we you, you said it right, but we work with people all the time who are super successful so we, I feel like I have learned to recognize how what makes these people different. Why do they feel so happy about sure. coming to work, doing what they do every day? And that, it, to the end of the day, going that road less traveled of success has created, I think, a happier, more fulfilled person. Sure. And I want to jump into what those two differences are. Okay. So let's talk about first, we have emotional well-being. Okay. That's the $75,000. That's checking the basics. That means that you can comfortably pay for your housing. You can pay for groceries. You can make sure the kids can go to school. I mean, it's all those type of things. There is a lot of research has gone into, is there a step, a, a portion of income that goes into where happiness is, where you're either much sadder if you don't reach this threshold, or you're really, you know, you're at a point of happiness without much incre incremental improvement, and that number was that seventy-five thousand dollars. So, if I'm hearing you correctly, from zero to seventy-five thousand, uh, it might be kind of hard to make ends meet. It might be hard to do all the things you want to do the way you want to when you want to. But once you hit that seventy-five thousand dollar threshold, you are less concerned about the roof over your head, what you're going to eat, keeping the lights on, those sort of things. It, and it's not that not having money makes you just sad. Sure. What it actually does is it just highlights you feel ground upon in this world, meaning sure. that things that are actually going on in your life feel kind of multiplied or amplified mm -hmm. with, you know, the, your struggles. You know, the example is if you've got somebody who's going through a divorce, mm -hmm. you know, obviously below 75,000, it's a, it's a, it's a harsher experience sure. than somebody who has, that's, that's kind of how they quantified it okay. in, in, in the research. Um, but I wanted to kind of go a little bit further and talk about, I thought it was interesting that I think a lot of us, when we talk about the whole 
the the flashy rich the, it, what, what the public puts forward or the news media puts out there is rich the lifestyles the lifestyles i think a lot of us will look at these people and we go that's what i aspire to because man do those people look happy now don't get me wrong there's a lot of very rich people that are super unhappy yep. but i mean and, and because i think that you're going to find out when i go through the stats there's a lot of unhappiness that's just built into your genetics. Sure. So there are rich people that they came into it, you know, in some way, and it didn't provide fulfillment for them. But a lot of the people that you see on TV, you know, if you think about it, these are titans of industry. These are people who have had a lot of success, been promoted. Now they're now running companies or somebody invented something. You know, they, they've um, started a small business, they're successful. And I think a lot of us look at them and we see their wealth, we see their happiness, we see that they're kind of conquering the world one step at a time, and we equate that happiness to the money they have. Okay. I will tell you, my thought is, is that the happiness is actually a, I mean, the money mm -hmm. is a side effect of the success that they have. Okay. Meaning that the fulfillment, the happiness that makes them feel like they're happy to get out of bed, that they're happy to feel like that they are making the world a better place, is more coming from the successes of their life than it is from the money. The money is just a, side, a effect side effect of doing what they're supposed to be doing on this earth. Okay. And, and I thought it was interesting. We've read enough books. You brought this up when we were doing show note yep, prep. Yep. Malcolm Gladwell has a book out there called David versus Goliath. Right. And I love this book because it, it talks about all kinds of things. You know, I have a, I, I'm, I'm dyslexic. I have a dyslexic daughter. He talks about desired difficulties. difficulties. Yep. And, that, and, you know, so that's the book that kind of talks about those things, how you can actually turn negative things into a what you perceive as a negative thing can actually be turned into a positive sure. well he also talks about how things that you might perceive as a super positive thing like being wealthy can actually be a horrible thing yep. for <laughs> happiness and the, the example he gives Bo, that and you you talked about this in our planning session is that the, it's not uncommon when you're a parent and you're a parent who's poor and you have children you can tell your children you can't buy for them mm -hmm. because you truthfully you just literally can't don't have the buy. Means you don't do have it. the money. You don't have the resources to provide things for them. So there's a struggle there. There's a group, probably this group over 75,000, mm -hmm. because that's actually what Malcolm references yep, in the book. Right. It's kind of like the donut hole, hole of good um, parenting and the fact that once you can cover the basic necessities, now you can focus on being a parent and what resources you give your kids what resources you hold away from your kids to try to teach them how sure. life works. The problem, and this is where it kind of talks about the inverse relationship of something which you think would be a benefit is actually a negative. Wealth and parenting is that parents that are really wealthy, mm -hmm. they get in a situation where now if they withhold something, like why should your car, um, why should your child on their 16th birthday get a Mercedes? Well, yeah. we all know. That's, that's not great. Uh, just telling you that is not good parenting, I think, to, to take your kids, because it's not their money, it's your money, sure. to give your kids premium or luxury right out of the gate pushes all of their, all those achievements and success moments. Because I think, like me, I started off in a raggedy 1984 Cavalier that was my wife when I picked her up from my first date in college. When she asked the friend who I was picking up what color my car was, she said, Russ. And I mean, she wasn't <laughs> kidding. You didn't know what color. You know, from that to my first Mazda, then I got, you know, I, I went through all these sure. different cars before I got to where I am now. And there's some, some, there's some success and fulfillment from feeling like I walked through those steps. So what I think you're saying is that uh, in Malcolm Gladwell's book, he was suggesting that up to a certain level, parenting's hard. Then at that $75,000 threshold up to another level, it's not as hard and you can focus on different stuff. And then above that level, it gets hard again because when you don't do something for your kids, it's not because you can, it's because you won't. And so it's yeah. actually a, a perceived good thing that actually makes it much more difficult. And that's why you, I think you do see a lot of kids that have wealthy parents that are kind of making some of those questionable decisions sure. by their, they're giving car kids too much too early. And that's why you also usually see a lot of kids that are that from wealthy families that get kind of depressed. Okay. I mean, I think it's because they've gotten too much of the world too early, and then they, they're in the shadow of these sure. successful ways. So it goes back to my point, and this is the, the point to kind of close it out, is that it's not the money that made the, the happiness mm -hmm. and the fulfillment. It's the journey, and that's right. what I want to kind of get into. So if we know that money is not what creates 
happiness or the fulfillment that I think we're all looking for, let's kind of talk about what is it? What are the things? Because that's what you really want to increase. After you make it past the survival and get past the 75,000, you're trying to figure out how do you actually increase that fulfillment, the fulfillment factor, factor that you're on doing everything you're supposed to while you're on the earth. You're doing things in a very deliberate way that, that gives you purpose. So let's kind of jump into this. Uh, first, before I talk into the way you should use your money as a resource, let's talk about the three common mistakes that prevent people from achieving true happiness yep. or that second level of happiness, which is the fulfillment, which I think most people are trying to seek. Sure. Um, and this, by the way, was inspired by Jonathan Clements and his book, How to Think About Money. By the way, we're still going to have Jonathan on soon. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be getting with Reby here in the next few days, and we're going to be sending out some dates and getting in contact with him to get him on the show. But here's number one, and these are three of them. Number one, was pay attention to your peer group because here's the number one mistake that Jonathan mentions. If you're in a position of feeling deprived, you're undercutting your happiness potential. So if you're if you're surrounding yourself with folks of means who have the ability to do certain things and you are not able to do those things and not able to keep up with the Joneses, it actually decreases the level of happiness you experience on a, or fulfillment you experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Wealth is relative. Okay. I mean, if you because I think people think there's a dollar amount in your head of what you need to be wealthy. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that wealth, that's that number that's in your head is probably highly influenced on the people you run with. And sure. I'll give you, we have, I've run across people in my life that I have been shocked because they make multiple million dollar incomes. Yep. But when you talk to them, you can sense there's something missing on that fulfillment or happiness. And then you find out a little deeper is that they run with people that if they're making a few million dollars a year in income, which we all, the average person on the street, you say, wow, That's incredible. that yeah. person is incredible. You find out that they're running with people who are, you know, who are worth 50, 100 million dollars. Yep. They feel poor. That's I right. know that to, to us that seems ridiculous, but I'm just telling you, wealth is relative. Sure. So pay attention to who you're hanging out with because if you are the poorest person among your friend group or you're the poorest person on your street, we just did a show on common financial thoughts that you ought to just ignore. Yeah. And one of them I brought up was is you do not want to live in the smallest house on the street if you're the poorest person yep. on the street because that might be a good financial decision on the appreciation potential of your house but it's going to be a highly detrimental to your long-term happiness. And I think what's so interesting is that in the world in which we live now, we actually have like anecdotal case study evidence on this now, uh, people are constantly seeking validation from social media outlets, right? Mm -hmm. They're using Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, these other things to try to uh, either aspire to a certain lifestyle or present a certain lifestyle. Yep. And what you find is it's a highlight reel. It's not the real picture. It's an and that, airbrushed highlight reel. That's exactly too. right. So number two, Live close to work. This one kind of shocked me a little bit is because major mistake number two is commuting is terrible for happiness. Yeah, you know, I think I, I'm curious about this. I'm curious to get your take because this is like very specific. Don't no. live far away from work. You know, I, I thought about that. Okay, would I care if I had it? Because I know a lot of folks who have a 40 minute hour long drive and they love it. A lot of our listen. audience, they listen to the Money Guys show. They listen show. to the show. They like, the, they like to listen to audiobooks or podcasts. Here's what here's the the I think the money I take on this is uh, inconvenience or unnecessary inconvenience leads to unhappiness. Potentially, potentially. And, and but uh, don't shoot the messenger. I want to read the research okay. report because here's the here's the research that Jonathan Clements mentioned that there was a study of 909 employed women in Texas that and they looked at 19 daily activities. Okay. Do you know what ranked as the worst activity was the commute? Really. Number That was the morning commute, by the way. The third worst activity from the bottom was the evening commute. Do you remember what the second one was? I don't remember what the next uh, driving, the worst thing was. Driving, It's probably like taking out taking trash, trash or something. I was going to say I, taking it's out probably the probably trash. Nothing, nothing great. But and it, there was another study he referenced that there was a study mm -hmm. in Sweden that found if your commute was over 45 minutes, that it increased your risk of divorce by as much as 40%. So as we were thinking about this in show prep, Brian, we're talking, okay, well, how do, how do we bring this back? How something, well, you know, it's not uncommon, especially if you live near, near uh, a major city center and possibly you work in that major city center, the further away you get from that city center, generally speaking, the easier it is or the less expensive real estate is. Yeah. So you might be thinking, you know what, rather than living close to work, rather than being convenient, I'm going to go build my McMansion 
an hour away because that's where I can afford it and I can do the big house and I can do all that stuff. What this found is, what, what I think this study found was chasing that, you know, chasing that lifestyle thing instead of the convenience of being close to work might not be something that's going to set you up for long-term I happiness. I think it foreshadows you to what I'm going to show you is the aha moment at the end of the show is, is that the things are not going to be the secret sauce that's for you. Right. It's not going to be the magical thing. So, cause you're exactly right, Bob. I made this mistake when I lived in Atlanta, I moved to one of the outer suburbs because if you just moved 20 minutes more south, mm -hmm. you got a much bigger house, sure. you got a much bigger piece of land, and you felt like this is what you need to do. But and I, I, you, you make great friends, but the problem is, is that from a convenience mm -hmm. side of quality of life, of opportunities, of entertainment, yep. um, restaurants, those type of things, you find out it's just not as good as you thought. And those are the things you're going to find out, guys. It's the experiences. It's those spending time with friends, with family, and having those opportunities for quality of life that's going to ring the bell of happiness much more than that big, beautiful house that's on right. the big, beautiful lot that you kind of think is going to do. So let's kind of, let's move on to number three. And this is, it ties in perfectly. This is, this is a good one because we talk, now, by the way, this is what I added is that pay attention to this funny word, which is the Diderot effect. Mm -hmm. We're going to end up owning, because the Diderot effect, we're going to single-handedly make this a more popular concept. <laughs> because, you know, it wasn't until probably a year and a half ago, two years ago, when we did our first show on it. I don't know that I'd ever heard this the principle said, but now I feel like more and more often it's coming up in financial media. Yep. And I, I like to think that's kind of the money guy because echo. Of us, yeah. and, but here's, here's the thing. Major mistake number three that Jonathan mentioned was we are inclined to use our money to buy more and more possessions. But because I think we have this mindset that the more things that I own or the nicer things that I own or the bigger things that I own, the more happy I must be. But most of us are reasonable. We don't want all the nice things. Right. We just want to do the big house. That'll be good enough. I'll just do the big house. Get a little extra space. That's That'll the dream. Okay. There's, there's always, I love when... Um, you know, some I, I think I can't remember if it's Pinterest or what, but people will post the picture of the recipe box and then they'll post what it actually looked like when they yeah, made yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the cupcakes uh -huh. or whatever, you know, and, and the projects. Well, it's kind of the same way your dream in your mind is you, you hear the birds are chirping, you got the, the picket fence and you got your, your sprawling land and your big honking house and you're like, this is going to be awesome. And then the reality is, is that the bigger house, well, the bigger lawn is going to require more landscaping, bigger, yep. more grass cutting, bigger lawn more time. There's going to be a bigger house to clean. There's going to be more furniture to put. Yep. And I'm not trying to sound like Debbie Downer, but on it's the just house, true. Yeah. But this is kind of the difference between dream versus reality. So I think sometimes, and here's the other part: you go quickly figure out, and that I have this is a concept that is more and more often coming before me. When we buy goods or things. There is an initial spark. Mm -hmm. You're like, woo! It's a it's a lift me up. You yeah, know, you get sure. that new car, you're like, woo, it's great. You know, your new house. Problem is they've done research. We adapt too quickly. That's right. It's that hedonic treadmill is that when we have a something big or good happening or we go buy something, we do get a little pick me up, mm -hmm. but then we quickly absorb it. And then you're just like when you buy the big McMansion. You know, with the fancy tile, the fancy granite, the quartz countertops or whatever. You know, it, the first few months you live in it, you're like, I can't believe I live here. Right. But six months, seven months, eight months in the future, you just kind of, just it the all same old blends house. in. Yeah. I mean, and that's something that I've noticed. We do adapt way too quickly to the excitement, yep. but we're left with the debt. We're left with the maintenance. We're left with all the things. That's and right. that's why it doesn't really help your happiness. That's exactly right. So let's talk about if that was the three big mistakes, are there any things that we can actually do with our money that does bring us happiness? Because I don't want to go out here and kill your dreams of the fancy car, the big house, and then not give you the breadcrumbs of how to actually create happiness and fulfillment with your relationship with money. Yep. So here's the four ways to spend money that can bring happiness. And this is based upon research that was done by Elizabeth Dunn and Michael Norton. And by the way, when you start researching the relationship of money and happiness, you know, Dunn and, and Norton are names that show up in everybody's research sure. too. So all this stuff is coming off of a lot of the same sheet music. So the first one is number one, and you've heard us talk about this, focus on experiences rather than things. Yeah, for sure. You know, I think what's so interesting, you talk about that, hedonic treadmill where 
uh, you buy a new thing, a new doodad, and it's real shiny and exciting to start with, but as time goes on, you get less shiny, less excited. Here's what I found about memories. Uh, I go on a trip or I do something with my kids and it's awesome and I love it. Now it's euphoric. Right. And then as time passes and I reflect upon that thing, it actually gets better with time. I think about that memory or I think about that experience or I think about that thing. It actually gets sweeter and more enjoyable the longer I'm able to reflect and, upon And it. there's actually something to that in the fact that a lot of research shows that as we age, all of your memories, because I was going to say something, but you're, you're a better man than me, Bo, because sometimes when you go on vacations, especially with little itty bitties like yeah, you yeah, have, yeah. there's actually a lot of just junk that you put <laughs> up with. You know, the kids don't feed themselves, they don't potty themselves, and you are the one taking care of them. They poop by but the pool? But there's enough good stuff. Well, that it's, it's not that. Well, they, I mean, but, but you get to put swimmers on them. Oh, you have yeah. to make sure, I mean... Yeah, sunscreen naps, every four naps, and a half minutes. Sunscreen. The the way you have to pack the car where you almost need a U-Haul trailer <laughs> yeah. to cover all the things. All these things. But here's a you, you just nailed it though, is that a few years goes by and you look back and you go, Man, that was I remember my daughter awesome. jumping in. For that was the first sweet. Time. I remember yeah. doing the first few swims I had with my daughter. I remember when she learned to swim. All the negative stuff goes away. It's a beautiful thing yep. with memories. Now compare and contrast that to your goods, your things. Your big, beautiful house. When I go, Bo, when you look at real estate, we live in a yep. great part of the country. We live here in the, the Franklin, Brentwood, Tennessee, which is a, a suburb of, of Nashville. If you want a deal, if you, if you want a deal, it, you want land and a deal on a house, you have to go look at these mansions mm -hmm. that are 25 to 30 years old. So yep. you know... When you, because they'll have land, they'll have a big exterior, but then you look at the pictures and you go, "Ooh, Ooh that was like ooh, that was about forty what, years ago." What were they doing? <laughs> did they, did they, did that shag carpet? Wow! I mean, it was, it was some crazy stuff. And that, that's, that's the thing that this, your possessions, your goods that you're buying, they age, they deteriorate. Right. Your memories get better, your experiences get better. Uh, in your memory, but then the stuff is is just falling apart. That's exactly right. Also, I, this is something that I'm about: eager anticipation. If, oh yeah. If you yeah, if yeah. you think about money and 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 it, when buying experiences over goods, just the part like when I do I do an annual golf trip with my buddies. Yep. Um, we have so many discussions about you know when when we pick out a house. We'll either pick on the guy who showed us this house because that's what guys do, uh -huh. or we'll talk about how awesome it is. We'll talk about where we're going to play golf. We'll talk about how many strokes this person's get. It's the anticipation. Yep. It's the, the same thing with my family. Yep. When we go to a Disney trip, my wife, we have so many conversations at night talking about all the ways we're going to do. Which park are we going to go to this day? Which restaurants do we want to try to get reservations for? All of this is, and that's good, that's healthy. A husband and wife, you know, a couple talking about this trip. Yep. That stuff is fun. So it, it, it's the eager anticipation that can be just as powerful in building memories yep. as just the event itself. That's powerful. And then C, here's the thing I think is great. If you were one of these guys that took, or girls, who right after college, like my buddies, right after high school, they drove west. They went to, we remember I grew like, up in Georgia. Like camping? They drove, they did two road trips in high school, right after high school while they were in college. One, they drove out to California and then drove back to Georgia. It was a cross country trip. Oh, wow. Another one, because that, that one went so well, they drove from Georgia up to Alaska. I kid you not, from Georgia. But, and here's the thing. I know the ugly bruises and the underbelly of what went wrong on these trips because, like, they had a car blow up, they lost an engine, they had to get somebody to drive another car up to them. It was some horrible stuff. But can I tell you, be honest with you, I didn't get to go. These are my best friends in the world. I didn't go on those trips because I had to earn money. I worked. Yeah. I look back on what I made those summers, which was probably around a thousand bucks a summer. Yeah. Who's the fool really in this situation? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I will just be honest with you. Who is the idiot in this situation? I should have jumped in the car, stayed at the KOA sites at night with them, and done these cross I'm yeah. kind of getting bothered thinking about this. And this is the thing is that every one of them, and I, I can share all the experiences in the world with them because we grew up since we were five years old, graduate high school together. We could get together, we're thick as thieves. But when they bring up the cross country to California, the cross country to Alaska, you're left out of that. I don't have those experiences. Yeah. And guys, here's the thing I want to tell you. 
if you don't come for money, but maybe you were, because uh, like some of my buddies, they were the Eagle Scouts that hiked the entire Appalachian Trail. Do you want to know what an equal? Because you know what? There's a lot of rich people that that is like their life goal is yeah, to go yeah, yeah. hike the apple. So my buddies, we don't come for money, but they let somebody know that they hiked the Appalachian Trail. Opens while they doors. Were, yeah. They were like, holy cow. Because here's the thing. It doesn't matter if they did it for, uh, you know, 200 or 400, a thousand bucks. Nobody knows how much you paid for your experience. There's no way to compare. Whereas I can go compare how much you paid for your house, yeah. how much I paid for mine, and we can put something with that. Good, you can compare. Experiences, you cannot compare who paid what. So it's amazing how you, when you share the ability to go out there and form community, form relationships. Sure. I mean, there's a lot of power in focusing on experiences rather than things. All right, so that's the first one. First way to wow. spend to make sure that happy. one, woo. <laughs> That one was deep, and I think it really kind of put an exclamation point on why it was important. Love it. Number two on four ways to spend money to bring happiness, to get that fulfillment type happiness, is to underindulge. I, see, I that, know. Is that one, is that that one bad? Just, it just Does sounds it so countercultural. We live in a culture that's about more and indulge and enjoy and live your best life now. How many times do we hear that? It's about indulgence today. I think about... What I love about it, though, because I, I, I try to reflect on these things. What is the first thing when somebody asks me, what's the secret to financial fulfillment and what's the secret to financial independence? The answer is exactly the same. Okay. Deferred gratification. If you can take a little bit of today for an outstanding, spectacular tomorrow, it works both if you think about underindulging with your resources and your money, it, it works with underindulging with your money so that you can build a financial independence in the future. Yep. It truly is incredible. And here's the other thing about underindulging. I, I love fruit. I love eating fruit. If you can no give idea me, where you're going no, no, this. no, but, but hear me out on this. Cause I think it's a good analogy. And I just, this is coming off the cuff. Cause I was thinking about what I'm hungry for right now. And, and what I did while we were on a break between shows, you give me a bowl of blueberries, strawberries, in, or, you know, and a banana or something. I love the taste of it. But you want to know what happens if you go and you eat three or four Hershey's Kisses before you eat the blueberry or the strawberry? Oh, it doesn't taste as good. It, it's, it's not good because yeah. you had too much sweetness come in at once. Well, it's the same thing with underindulging. I don't care what you do. If you're fa like my, oh, my family loves going to Disney World. Mm -hmm. If we went to Disney World four times this year, I don't know that we would love it as that much. That it would be a special. Because yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're basically binging on this thing and you start taking it for granted. I don't think... So scarcity... I mean, Bo, you're, you're, hey, look, I'm going to pick on you. Even though you got married super young, I do think you had more game dating than I did. <laughs> so what is the always the key rule about dating is that it's just like if you had a great date, you're not supposed to call at 7 or 8 a.m. the next no morning. No way, You're supposed man. to be a scarce resource... Because that, that creates fondness, you know, right. so it, the memories grow if you underindulge in activities you yep. enjoy because you appreciate them. They're that much sweeter. They're that much better if you're not just gorging yourself on this. Well, and I think it's beautiful too, Brian. You, you already used this example. I think you said, you know, your first car was a, a Cavalier and then you had a Toyota and then you had a, a Mazda, then a Toyota. You didn't come out of the gate with a Mercedes. You didn't come out yeah. of the gate with an Audi. You didn't come out of the gate with a Tesla. By allowing yourself to have those experiences earlier on, you save the fulfillment experience of having that nice car for later in life, which yeah. is when you're actually able to enjoy it and you can afford the insurance on it. You can afford the premium gas for it or the premium electricity for the Tesla or whatever. <laughs> I want one more tip because this is not really in there, but it's something I've recognized from managing money of successful people because I do it and I've seen a lot of my clients do this. Whenever you're going to make a big purchase, if you want to prolong, like what's, what's the best place? If you've been in a huge line that you waited, like they had a brand new restaurant open up down the street today. Oh, and yeah. It was a huge Grilled line. Cheeser, yep. Do you know when the best place and probably the most enjoyment is going to occur? When you're the very first person that's going to be next to be ordered. Yeah. Meaning you waited in line for 45 minutes. You're next to get to the cash register to order your sandwich or whatever they're yeah, selling yeah, yeah. at this place. They had the huge line today. 
That is the ideal place to be is when you're next to be served because you have the maximum anticipation. You're ahead of all these people. There's all kind of just things exploding inside of you that bring happiness. Well, guess what? The same thing can happen if you research, over-research the big purchases. Okay, I think yeah. about one of my clients. She's probably going to listen to this because she's a, she's a podcast client, listener that became a client. She wanted an RV for retirement. I, I kept saying, well, have you, you've got the money. Have you bought the RV? And she was like, nah, I'm going to do a little more research. Because that's, what, another, that's a- another, another three months. Goes, have you, nah, I mean, I, <laughs> I watched a few YouTube videos on it. I know I could buy it, but I'm just going to hold off. She was sitting in that number one spot on deck waiting to go buy her yep. thing. So she was just squeezing a little bit more. So if you want to expand the excitement of the purchase – over research it. Yeah. I love it. I do it. And I think it's a good thing. And it also ties into the underindulge skill set. I love it. Number three on four ways to spend that bring happiness spend on someone else. Oh, an interesting one. The whole generosity principle. Um, you know, how we, forever you hear around the holidays, it's much better to give than to receive. Sure. No eight year old believes that. No. I mean, I can no. tell you. I've got two little girls. I got a four year old and a two year old. They do not believe that either one. Uh, I mean, neither one is You can tell by the way they rip into to gifts and stuff. But as you get a little age, a little wisdom under you, there is something to it. There is nothing on my birthday or Christmas that you know is just. It, it is so much more fun for me on Christmas when we're passing out gifts. I love watching people open gifts that you've given them. Yeah. I like doing stuff for people. It's something when you get to the point that you're actually tithing and being charitable. I think there really is, and the research shows it, guys, is that if you will, they've done so many studies showing if you were given a pot of money Mm -hmm. and you had the option of spending it on yourself versus going and spending on somebody else, there is both mental as well as physiology things that occur to you that you're happier and more fulfilled if you're spending that money on somebody else. I love it. We had more. I mean, I have so much research on here, but I just don't want to drown people in the, the whole giving. But I, I want you to go do some research if you want to be fascinated on well, how much powerful it is. And, and I think what's really, really interesting, and I think we've seen this with a lot of our uh, clients who've reached financial independence. You know, a couple weeks ago, we did an entire episode on the financial independent retire early uh, movement and idea. One of the things that we found is that even though there are folks who've reached this level where Uh, They are financially independent. So if they so chose, they could go sit on the beach and sit Mai Tais and live that life. That's not actually the thing that they want to do. What they want to do is now that they have the time freedom, they want to go volunteer with their favorite organization. They want to go pour into the lives of others. This is not just about spending money on someone else or giving money away. Well, a lot of the studies, that's how they anecdotally did that. We've seen personally with our clients that one of the ways that they experience the most happiness is taking their whole family on a cruise, taking all the siblings, all the grandkids, and taking them on a river cruise. Because that marries multiple things. The experiences right. plus you're also being generous. Yep. It really is a magic. And I like the fact that, because we do have a number of clients that are, I guess you would call them fire because yep. they are financially independent earlier. But it is kind of one of those things that we've gotten a lot of comments about. They didn't just quit. That's right. They're going to go find something more fulfilling that actually go work for causes or do things, teach, educate, do all kinds of things. And that leads to number four, which are four ways to spend that bring happiness. And this one, this one is going to be a little bit, you're going to hear this and be like, really? That's the secret? That's the secret to us? That's what this all boils down to, the secret to life and fulfillment with money? Listen to this. Number four is faith, family, community, and work. Okay. So those, faith, those family, are the words. Anywhere. Faith, family, community, and work. So here's the thing. Everything when I talk about money, happiness, fulfillment, and their relationship, you're going to find out that you don't control as much as you think you control. Let me give you some examples. There's research that shows that 48% of your happiness, close to half, right. is straight up genetics. So you're just born with it. You're you either, happy you, or You unhappy. come out of your, your parents, you know, your mom. I don't know why I said parents. <laughs> it's not like you're having a baby. But you come out of your mother... You know, a predisposed to be happy, or you come out kind of as a grump. Look, we all come out crying. Some of us just stop a little bit earlier. So that's 48%. The other part is big life events. I know you just, we'll keep it going. I'm trying to keep this show together. The other is big life events. Things that happen to you throughout your life do influence your yep. happiness. So you got genetics. You got things that happen to you. You find out that you really only control about 12% of the things 
that you can do. The, oh, the, the choices. You're only in control of about These, this is the, the how much do you have to control of your percent of 100 percent of happiness? 48 is genetic. 40 is just life events that happen to you that are yep. kind of you know just your choices and other things that happen. And then the 12 is the things that really matter. Okay. Now this 12 can have an influence on the 40 sure, as, you, as you'll hear. But the, here's what they are. The, the 12 are faith. Is are you thinking about things that are not of this world? Sure. They have they have proven or shown in a lot of research because proven is such a strong word. But they've done shown in a lot of research that people of faith and it's not one particular faith, but sure. just some, thinking outside this world, those people are happier than people who are, who not. are not. Okay. Um, number two, family. If you have solid family relationships, if you're spending time with friends, with family, and and doing things like that. That is a big contributor, sure. and you should focus on doing things with your family. Three is community, and that ties back to what I'd already said, being charitable and connecting, giving your time, yep. you know, d- being able to take family and do things. That's community is how you connect with the world. And here's the fourth one I'm going to spend a little time on is work. Okay. And now this one is interesting to me. So one of the... I want to make sure I understand this. So one of the things that we can spend money on to bring ourselves happiness, or we can spend time on to bring ourselves happiness... Is work? Well, I know. That seems it's, counterintuitive. Well, Most people are what working are, for what the What are weekend. we trying to figure out here? We're trying to figure out what is it that brings you this level of fulfillment that when you wake up in the morning, you feel like what you're put on this planet to do is kind of being fulfilled. And just because you do have that feeling that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and you're making the world a better place, it does drive that super happiness that people kind of see it's it's going beyond just contentment sure. happiness and and that's what they found out because this is the part that's over the 75,000 earn success people who at work feel like that they are appreciated and you, look a lot of you guys right now you're hearing this you go yeah that's the guy who started the company probably no yeah. the research shows it doesn't matter if it's a multimillionaire who's the founder of the company or the guy who puts the wheels on the cars, if they feel like that they're really good at it and they add value and purpose and they're doing exactly what they're supposed to, it pushes their entire just attitude and fulfillment that they do, are, they are happier people. And it's and it's visibly seen by those around them. So I think it's, you said, because it's not about what you earn. It's not about the dollars it's and cents that money. you make. And that's what, it goes back to, Wealth is a side effect of doing what sure. you're supposed to, but keep going. I'm sorry. Okay, no, I, you. no, that was a perfect segue because one thing I've heard you say, and I've heard you say this 10,000 times no matter what you do, if you do the thing that you feel like you're put on this earth to do and you do it well, you're in the top five, 10% of people who do that. It's amazing how the financial success, that, that, that happiness to meet the necessities, kind of just finds a way to show up. It, that's a great point because, uh, you know, I do have that client that. He has great adult children. They're super successful. And I asked him, I said, what's the secret? What did you do as a parent that made them step out and be different than their peers? And, and, you know, and financially as well as just other things. He goes, here's what I told my kids growing up. He goes, I told them to quickly, I said, sometime during your childhood, I need you to figure out what you do better than 95% of the rest of the world. What are you in the top 5% of the world of doing? Because he goes, look, you know, what I told my kids is if you're good at cutting hair, if you're in the top 5% of haircutting, you'll be successful. Yep. You'll make more money than you can think about. And it's true. You can think of about any profession, and if you were world-class in it, and if you're doing what God put you on this planet to sure. do, you're going to feel pretty good about yourself. Love it. So, I mean, that is really, like I said, money and happiness is this weird thing. Because I think what if you ask people in the public, they're thinking, I just spend what I want to. I spend it on my own terms when I want to. It's not always about the level of money. As we've seen from the research, that base level of contentment or happiness occurs at 75000 yeah. If you want fulfillment, meaning that your life, your purpose is being shown every day, you need to think about what are you good at? Where do you connect? And then that's what's going to really go make you feel good about waking up in the morning. It's not about the Benjamins in your pocket. It's not about the Benjamins that's in your 401k. It's about what you're supposed to be doing on this planet and you can be successful with it. I love it. So guys, this is the Money Guy Show. I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen. You can see we got a counter here. This is YouTube. We want you to go sign up, subscribe, 
ring the bell, let us know you like it. This is kind of one of those touchy feely type shows sure. because we want to keep you focused on not only how much is in your account, but making sure you're focusing on the spiritual, making sure you're focusing on keeping yourself healthy where you sure. like being here. And then we're going to help you. We had other shows. We've done all kinds of shows on how do you grow? How do you get a million dollars? How do you, you know, how much insurance do you need? Sure. I mean, there's all kinds of things. We get into the analytical stuff. If you like what we're doing and we're just completely giving you this free advice, we were just were featured in Forbes, we were one of the top shows, it just gives it away. Yep. That's on purpose. We call that the abundance cycle. We want you to come, let us love on you. You come and take all the free advice, you learn, you apply, you grow. And then what do you know? One day you turn into this super successful empire builder. That's going to be the point where you say, you know what? This is beyond what I can do by myself. Mm -hmm. I need to get somebody in here to be my co-pilot, to be my CFO, yep. even though it's a, a word that people aren't supposed to use anymore. Um, you're going to look at that and you're going to say, I'm going to remember there was the Money Guy show. It was Brian and Bo that hooked me up, and that's when you're going to reach out. So go to our Contact Us page, both on themoneyguy.com or you can go to aboundwealth.com. We will hook you up. We have a blast doing this. And just thank you, thank you, thank you. Anything else you want to add, Bo? No, if you haven't gone out to the website, The Money Guy Show, sometimes we create deliverables that we make available Good to point. you guys. That's why yeah, I count on you. If we don't have your email address, we cannot get it in your hands. We do not put it on the website. We do not do it any other way than to our email list. It's a special connection that we have with you. So if you're interested in spreadsheets, worksheets, documents, follow-ups, lists, all of the above, go out to moneyguy.com, give us your email address so we can stay in contact. And we just love that we get to hang out here and do this with you. Thanks, guys. I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hanson. We'll be back soon.